Francis Bacon. Bacon, 1909 to 1992, was an Irish-born British painter whose abstract portraits of grotesque, distorted figures made him one of the most distinctive and controversial artists of the post-war era. To the outside observer, Bacon appeared to thrive on disorder. His studios were environments of extreme chaos, with paint smeared on the walls and a knee-high jumble of books, brushes, papers, broken furniture, and other detritus piled on the floor. More agreeable interiors stifled his creativity, he said. And when he wasn't painting, Bacon lived a life of hedonistic excess, eating multiple rich meals a day, drinking tremendous quantities of alcohol, taking whatever stimulants were handy, and generally staying out later and partying harder than any of his contemporaries. And yet, as the biographer Michael Pepiat has written, Bacon was essentially a creature of habit, with a daily schedule that varied little over his career. Painting came first. Despite his late nights, Bacon always woke at the first light of day and worked for several hours, usually finishing around noon. Then another long afternoon and evening of carousing stretched before him, and Bacon did not dawdle. He would have a friend of the studio to share a bottle of wine, or he would head out for drinks at a pub, followed by a long lunch at a restaurant and then more drinks at a succession of private clubs. When evening arrived, there was a restaurant supper, a round of nightclubs, perhaps a visit to a casino, and often in the early morning hours, yet another meal at a bistro. At the end of these long nights, Bacon frequently demanded that his reeling companions join him at home for one last drink, an effort, it seems, to postpone his nightly battles with insomnia. Bacon depended on pills to get to sleep, and he would read and reread classic cookbooks to relax himself before bed. He still slept only a few hours a night. Despite this, the painter's constitution was remarkably sturdy. His only exercise was pacing in front of a canvas, and his idea of dieting was to take large quantities of garlic pills and shun egg yolks, desserts, and coffee, while continuing to guzzle a half dozen bottles of wine and eat two or more large restaurant meals a day. His metabolism could apparently handle the excessive consumption without dimming his wits or expanding his waistline, at least not until late in his life, when the drinking finally seemed to catch up with him. Even the occasional hangover was, in Bacon's mind, a boon. I often like working with a hangover, he said, because my mind is crackling with energy and I can think very clearly. Simone de Beauvoir Beauvoir, 1908-1986 was a French writer and existential philosopher. Her 1949 treatise, The Second Sex, is a landmark of contemporary feminism. I'm always in a hurry to get going, though in general I dislike starting the day. Beauvoir told the Paris Review in 1965, I first have tea and then at about 10 o'clock I get underway and work until 1. Then I see my friends and after that at five o'clock, I go back to work and continue until nine. I have no difficulty in picking up the thread in the afternoon. Indeed, Beauvoir rarely had difficulty working. If anything, the opposite was true. When she took her annual two or three month vacations, she found herself growing bored and uncomfortable after a few weeks away from her work. Although Beauvoir's work came first, her daily schedule also revolved around her relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre, which lasted from 1929 until his death in 1980. Theirs was an intellectual partnership with a somewhat creepy sexual component. According to a pact proposed by Sartre at the outset of their relationship, both partners could take other lovers, but they were required to tell each other everything. Generally, Beauvoir worked by herself in the morning, then joined Sartre for lunch. In the afternoon, they worked together in silence at Sartre's apartment. In the evening, they went to whatever political or social event was on Sartre's schedule, 
or else went to the movies or drank scotch and listened to the radio at Beauvoir's apartment. The filmmaker Claude Lonsmann, who was Beauvoir's lover from 1952 to 1959, experienced this arrangement firsthand. He described the beginning of their cohabitation in Beauvoir's Paris apartment. On the first morning, I thought to lie in bed, but she got up, dressed, and went to her work table. You work there, she said, pointing at the bed. So I got up and sat on the edge of the bed and smoked and pretended that I was working. I don't think she said a word to me until it was time for lunch. Then she...